when an NBA team goes through a disappointing season or they lose earlier than they thought in the playoffs, you can definitely learn a lot about the makeup of a front office, the coaching staff, and the players. Do they come back stronger the next year or do they collapse? The teams in this video either learned from their loss and got better the next year, or they were a shell of themselves the next season and the team looked completely different roster wise. No lie, this is one of my favorite videos I've done research for and I liked how it turned out, so leave a like if you can because it does help the video and the channel grow. The 2013 Spurs are how I got the idea for this video and they are the true definition of a team that was never the same after taking a loss in the playoffs. The Spurs that year only lost two games in the West playoffs, they swept the conference finals and were up 3-2 over the Miami Heat in the finals. But we know what happened, Ray Allen made a corner 3 to tie the game and they went on to lose in overtime and went on to lose game 7. The crazy thing about that series is that the Spurs in their history have never been down in an NBA final series, never. The Heat winning game 7 was their first time. That Ray Allen shot and the NBA finals loss broke the Spurs for a bit. Tony Parker said he never saw his team so broken. Manu Ginobili said that game ruined him mentally. There was some uncertainty about the future of Popovich, Duncan, Ginobili, and Parker that offseason. They were getting older and they weren't sure if they'd all be back. But after some time, Popovich held a meeting with those guys and decided no way they are done. Popovich said in an interview, as the summer wore on, I got angrier and angrier. I wanted to pull the guys back together and appeal to them and challenge them. I wanted to ask them, when you are kicked in the gut, how will you respond? Basically, Pop said, let's take this on the chin and make another run, but the whole team needed to accept what happened and move on. During training camp for the next season, Popovich showed the video of the Ray Allen shot to the team so they could mourn together and move on. And they did move on. They had the best record in the NBA, and after beating the Oklahoma City Thunder in the 2014 Western Conference playoffs, Tim Duncan, who says things in interviews that never really get attention, got the attention of LeBron in the heat with this one. We got four more to win, we'll do it this time. Then in the next day, Duncan said, we're happy it's the Heat again, we'll be ready for them. This is probably when we should have known that the Heat were about to get obliterated. This is one of the better title guarantees that isn't really talked about much. They destroyed the Heat in the finals that year. 12 of their 16 playoff wins were by double digits and they beat out the 1965 Celtics for the largest point differential in NBA Finals. The decision to start Boris Diaw after Game 2 was when everything went downhill for Miami. The Spurs broke the heat with their ball movement and 3 point shooting. It was pretty nuts, there was definitely something different in the air that season in San Antonio. They weren't losing to the heat again. The next team is the 2010-2011 Miami Heat, who came into the season with massive hype around a superstar trio that was formed in free agency. After losing just 3 games in the East playoffs that year, the Miami Heat took one of the more humiliating NBA Finals losses you will ever see, going up 2-1 on the Dallas Mavericks and losing 3 straight games to lose the Finals. Everybody from head coach Eric Spolstra, Pat Riley, to LeBron, to Wade, they knew they needed to make a change in the offseason. After meeting with Oregon football coach Chip Kelly, head coach Eric Spolstra found the style for the Heat's new offense that was going to be built on speed and versatility of their big three. If you remember those old Oregon football teams, they were built on their pace, spacing, and speed. And that's what the Heat did in their next season. Spolstra created an offense that opened up lanes for LeBron and Wade. You saw a lot more Chris Bosh at center and Shane Battier at power forward. It was a much more modern type of offense. LeBron himself knew he needed to make a change after collapsing in the finals. Around August of 2011, LeBron went to Hakeem Olajuwon to get better in the post. His face-up game was elite, but against the Mavericks, you could tell he was not comfortable at all in the times that he was posted up on players he should have been able to create mismatches on. And LeBron definitely did get in the post more in 2012. You saw a lot of backing down, drop steps, baseline spins, and pump fakes on the block against Indiana, Boston, and OKC in the finals. And for the final person who needed to make a change, it was Dwayne Wade. And he made one of the hardest basketball decisions of his life. In that 2012 season, instead of having them equally share the offense, Wade let LeBron control the offense while he took a back seat because he thought the my turn, your turn offense was not sustainable for another run. And Wade thought the only way this switch could happen is if it came directly from him. Here's something Dwayne Wade said during the season. I felt that it had to come from nobody but me to say, go ahead man, you're the best player in the world, we'll follow your lead, 
Once I said that, I thought he kind of exhaled a little bit. And the Heat did follow LeBron's lead. He went on to win the MVP that year, and Wade's points per game dropped to 22. There were a lot of competitive games that came down to the final minutes in the playoffs that year, but they had a certain edge to them the year after losing. Shane Battier noticed it as soon as he joined the team. Battier said, when I came to Miami in 2011, I had never seen a team with a bigger edge than that Heat group that lost to Dallas in the finals the year before. So I inherited that pain. The focus was so strong with that group that we could have played anybody, line them up, any historical team you want, and they would have had their hands full. You don't want to lose the finals like that in 2011 against the Mavericks, but that loss changed them forever and it got them two titles. Spolstra and Riley made big changes to the roster and team philosophy, and probably the biggest change was that Wade took a step back so LeBron could be the true number one. The 2013-2014 Indiana Pacers are an example of a team that completely collapsed after a playoff loss and never looked the same. That Pacers team was built on an elite defense and veteran guys that knew their role and bought into the team concept. Those Pacers teams were the main team giving the big three Miami Heat trouble in the East playoffs. The weird thing about the Pacers this year was that this was a 56 win team. They were winning games but you could tell something was off with them in the second half of the year. Like a lot of teams that collapse, chemistry issues hurt them. One of the first signs things were going bad was when Danny Granger was traded for Evan Turner. Even though Danny Granger didn't really play that much, he was a huge part of the locker room. David West explained it here. When we did that for Danny, I just sort of in my gut, I knew we weren't going to be able to get by the heat. Even though it was in February, I knew we'd be able to get through the first two rounds, but without Danny, without OJ, without Roy being mentally confident, I knew we weren't going to have enough to get by them. And they did not get by the Heat. They lost by 25 points in the final game of the series in the conference finals, and even nearly lost in the first round. To add on to that comment about Hibbert not being mentally ready, when the Pacers signed Andrew Bynum that season, it pretty much destroyed his confidence. Hibbert was putting up 0.0 rebound games before Tony Snell made it a thing, not to mention there were fights at playoff practices between Evan Turner and Lance Stevenson. This team was just mentally done. And after that 2014 season, the Pacers were never contenders in the Eastern Conference. Paul George suffered a near season-ending injury over the summer, and because of that, guys like Solomon Hill, CJ Miles, Rodney Stuckey were featured more on offense, and you're going nowhere with those guys. Lance Stevenson left, Roy Hibbert got even worse the next year, David West was getting old, the team was not the same, and they missed the playoffs the next year. The 2017-2018 Toronto Raptors were the strange case of somehow having the best regular season in team history and at the same time ending that season in the most embarrassing way possible. For the third straight playoff run, the Raptors were beat by LeBron and the Cavs, but the third time was even worse because the Cavs were just coming off a seven game series against the Pacers where they looked pretty vulnerable and the Raptors were the one seed. They were swept by the Cavs, and a lot of people were calling for the Raptors front office to blow this core up. We saw enough of the Kyle Lowry, DeMar DeRozan, and Dwayne Casey era. This team had reached its end point. They were just going to be another middling playoff team if they kept this team intact once you factored in the Sixers, the Bucks, and the Celtics coming back. And the Raptors began that offseason starting with the firing of head coach Dwayne Casey, and then that summer, they made the trade for Kawhi Leonard and Danny Green. Raptors president Masai Ujiri was pretty open about why he had to get rid of those two when talking to the media. When I came here, I gave Dwayne Casey and DeMar DeRozan a chance, but we kept giving them a chance and giving a chance, and at some point, we had to do something different. He's right, that era was done. It was either swing for the title or develop your young players. With Kawhi, they looked like an actual title contender that year and went on to win it all. You can never say that during the Lowry and DeRozan years. It was a huge turnaround in just one year and that loss in the playoffs to the Cavs changed everything. The 2017-2018 Celtics are the rare team that got worse and collapsed the next season after having major success in the playoffs. Even without Kyrie Irving and Gordon Hayward, the Celtics were one game away from the 2018 NBA Finals, and the next year there were big expectations. People thought them, Philly, or the Raptors were going to make the Finals. Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum led the Celtics in playoff points at just 21 and 20 years old. Terry Rozier was coming off of his best season, and when you add them in with Al Horford, Marcus Morris, and a healthy Kyrie and Hayward, on paper, they were going to be really tough for any team to beat. You were not crazy to think that this was a team that could make the Finals. But that's why they play the games. This team did not make the Finals the next year. They were a massive disappointment. 
they only won 49 games and were the fourth seed. Many things went wrong, but I think the main one was that they went into the season as if they won a ring or were entitled to something. It also did not look like they were having fun on the court together. They also dealt with new roles on offense. Kyrie and Hayward were back. Jalen and Jason were becoming better players and that meant less shot attempts for other guys. And the biggest loser was Terry Rozier, who went from averaging 17 points per game in the 2018 playoffs without Kyrie to six points per game in the 2019 playoffs. Also, Kyrie's free agency was a major cloud over the team. He says before the season that he will resign to a long-term deal with the Celtics, but as the season went on and they were losing games, Kyrie was getting more irritated every post-game interview, and the rumors about him leaving in the summer were at its peak. Not to mention the Anthony Davis trade stuff was happening at this time as well, so the young guys were in trade rumors. The combination of Kyrie's free agency, having expectations of winning the title, and everyone wanting a piece of the pie on offense built up the problems with Boston's chemistry, and it ended in ugly fashion when the Celtics lost four straight to the Bucks after winning game one. It's honestly crazy looking back at the type of talent this team had, because all of them are basically playing really well right now and having career years, but they could never get it together, and some of them had to find fresh starts, probably for the best. Moving on to another Paul George team, the 2018-2019 Oklahoma City Thunder. After taking a first round loss to the Utah Jazz the year before, a series they were favored in, some people thought Paul George was gone, but he re-signed with the team and basically said, we have unfinished business for the next season. Paul George did have the best individual season of his career that year, but the team wasn't anything special. They won 49 games, finished as the sixth seed, and in the playoffs, the Thunder were beaten five games by the Portland Trailblazers in the first round by a Dame Lillard three-pointer. That playoff loss made it their third straight season that they were knocked out in the first round. Let's not forget, this team was capped out and had nowhere to go unless they were moving a few of their core pieces, and that is what happened. Kawhi Leonard was a free agent in the summer of 2019 and was looking for a running mate. A few days later, Paul George was traded to the LA Clippers in one of the more shocking notifications I've read on my phone. Paul George being gone meant that this team was not going anywhere. There was no point of another now I do what I want Westbrook season. About a week after the George trade, the Thunder traded Russ to his preferred spot, the Houston Rockets, which meant that the final player of what was supposed to be Oklahoma City Thunder Dynasty was gone. For the last team, how about one that wasn't from the past decade, the 1989-1990 Chicago Bulls are another example of a team that took their L and came back stronger. In the summer of 1989 when the Chicago Bulls fired head coach Doug Collins, they promoted assistant coach Phil Jackson, and Michael Jordan was not too happy about it. He wasn't a big fan of Phil's philosophy at the time because he was taking the ball out of his hands. Phil let MJ know that it was going to be slightly different under him. I don't anticipate you're going to be the scoring champion in the league, the spotlight is on the ball, if you're the guy that's always going to have the ball, teams can generate a defense against that. That is what happened with the Pistons the last couple of years. And Phil was right, they just lost to the Detroit Pistons for the third straight postseason, and even though Jordan is putting up numbers, the Pistons knew what was coming and needed to be more unpredictable with the other guys. So from the 1990 season to the 1991 season, they went from the league's number 5 offense to the league's number 1 offense, they had the East's best record and went on to win their first title of 6 that decade. A specific moment where you saw Jordan's mindset change with Phil Jackson was during Game 5 of the 1991 NBA Finals. In about a year, Jordan went from I don't know about this Phil Jackson stuff to completely buying into the system and the team getting over the hump to win their first title of 6. Making this video makes you realize how much has actually changed in the NBA in just like three years. This might be my longest video I made. I'm not really sure, but it was definitely fun to go back and read some of these old quotes from players and coaches. Let me know how you're feeling about this one down in the comments. My next video might be on Trey Young or something else. I'm not really sure, but I'll see you guys then.